I I um was at a drum and bass festival on the weekend. I'm now very depressed. <laughs> uh, let's hope this gets me up and about. Hello you plonkers and welcome back to another video today on the True Footy channel. Round 7? Nine things we learned. Yeah, that's right, because Freo have lost five games in one too, so it's definitely round seven. If you're enjoying this series so far this season, make sure you leave a like and subscribe if you are new. Let's just get straight into it. Nine things we learned from round seven. Let's go. Number one, Port are back to their best. Think about where Port were prior to last year. I think last year now it just looks like a blip on the radar. They had that 0-5 start. But now it just looks like they left off where they were in years before, playing in prelims, going deep into finals. The players, they seem to love playing for Ken Hinckley. The passion that he displays as a coach, it's admirable and uh, something that I wish my coach had. But anyway, that's a separate point. Port, they absolutely dominated in the midfield battle against St. Kilda, particularly after the start of the second quarter. And I really like the mix that they have in there. Trav Boak, he had a massive game. But he plays a bit of an outside role now. He's not always on the inside it allows guys like Horn Francis, Rosie, and Butters to shine. What a game Jason Horn Francis had. I think that was the best game I've ever seen him play. Absolute bull in there. And just by their midfield being so dominant against a side who has been the toughest side to play this year, they managed to get field position. They used the ball really well. And they beat St. Kilda, whose defensive pressure around the ground has been pretty much unstoppable all year. So it was an absolutely massive win for Port Adelaide. Their season is well and truly on. Can they win the flag? Well, you can't say no because you don't know, but I don't think so. But they are definitely back on that trajectory that they were a few years ago. Definitely back to their best. Finn Lason is playing great football in that rock forward role as well. Up the pair. Number two, Lions dominate Frio in every stat. Contested possessions, lost. Clearances, lost. Marks inside 50s, lost. Shots on goal, lost. What else did we lose? We just got dominated by Brisbane. And to be honest, I wasn't expecting much out of this game. I knew Brisbane were going to win because Brisbane are an experienced side with plenty of talent, one of the best lists in the competition. So the result, no harm. But to just get absolutely dicked by the Lions, some bestiality in there. What am I saying? This is where my mind is right now after the last few weeks as a Frio fan. But I will say, coaching again, not good enough. Now, you can blame the players for not putting enough effort in or their skill execution isn't good enough or they're low on confidence because we're getting pumped every week now. But the coaching wasn't good enough. Exhibit A, last week against the Bulldogs, we're sort of in the game at three-quarter time. First few goals, we're back into that contest. Justin Longmuir decides, instead of having a centre-half forward push into the contest, that we're going to drop them back um, so we can have 6v6 in the forward line and create more opportunities. You've got to go for the game, but in the end, the Bulldogs continued to dominate the midfield battle, and without that extra number in the contest, they just ran all over us and ended up winning by, what was it, like 10 goals. And this week, we go for the handball style. We had way more handballs than kicks, and we just looked lost. Like It was like the players were told, right. First thing to think about is the handball. When you get the footy, handball. And they were just handballing it, handballing it, handballing it, handballing it, into trouble, into traffic. Lions pressure comes, we turn over the ball, and they score. Like, it was, ju it just looked like an amateur coaching performance, if I'm being honest. Really not happy with it. Um, so, yeah, question the players, question whatever you want, but the coaching simply hasn't been good enough in the past seven rounds, to be honest. So, JL has a lot of improvement. Him and the whole coaching panel have a lot of improvement because last year we were a top side in the competition, a borderline top four side, and now we've lost to Brisbane, who we beat last year, and the Bulldogs, who we beat last year. So in the last two weeks, you can see how far we have fallen. With the additions we've had this year, guys like Luke Jackson and Jager Romero, we shouldn't be falling down this much. And yeah, I think a lot of it's on the coaches. All credit to Brisbane, though, obviously. They're a great side, but, you know, I am purple... <laughs> But, you know, I am a purple man, so I am going to talk from a purple perspective. The Lions, they're roaring. The Dockers are crying and sinking. Number three, 
Toby Green wins the game alone. Midway through the fourth quarter, it looked like Sydney had punched through the wall and they were going to win the Battle of the Bridge or whatever they bloody call it over there. Uh, but until Toby Green kicks two insanely clutch high IQ goals, turns the game on its head and gets the win for GWS. It's a massive result for GWS and massively disappointing for Sydney. But Toby Green, I know he plays for GWS and these interstate teams don't get much recognition, but we all know how great of a player Toby Green is. Kane Corns labelled him as one of the best players in the competition and you can see why when he literally goes and wins a game which they weren't expected to win off his own boot. The IQ and the footy smarts in that last uh, that last stoppage where he gets that goal to separate from his man, get to the back of the stoppage and then have time on the ball to have a shot on goal. That is just something you'd never think of watching football. But Toby Green, he's just built different. Massive result for the new coaching panel at GWS. But for Sydney, they've lost the game that they should have won. They got pumped last week and they've lost the game that they should have won this week against GWS. Now they have to go to Collingwood and try to get a result at the G next week. So they've dropped four points. Real disappointing fortnight for the Swans. They've got to get back on the horse very soon. If they did it against Collingwood next week, that would be a massive result. We are still not seeing Sydney's best. I think they can get there this season. I'm not writing the season off for them, but just need a bit more discipline late for me. Number four, the Dogs are playing four-quarter football. Other than the first half being a bit of an arm wrestle against Hawthorne, the Dogs are playing four-quarter football. They're managing to stay in the contest for four quarters and bring their best late in games. They did it against Freo last week. They did it against the Hawks this week. Obviously not the stiffest competition, but the fact that they can stay in a contest and then accelerate through to the end is a great characteristic for a side to have. Hawthorne are getting back to what people have been saying about them for the last few years. Obviously, they're not the greatest side, but they can compete, and they did for two quarters. But the Bulldogs are now showing their experience and their maturity late in games. They're using that maturity to build into the contest, learn what's happening around them, and then adapt. And all their key forwards kicked multiple goals as well. So they're kicking winning scores. They're playing a four-quarter effort. The Bulldogs, they're building into this season nicely. A quick break in nine things we learned to promote my business, Druzy's Athlete Academy. If you're a footballer at home and you're wanting to improve your performance but don't know how to outside of your football, Druzy's Athlete Academy will guarantee to improve your performance. You can go to training, you can show up to games just like every other player on your team does, but it's about what you do away from the club that is going to make you an elite player. If you want to take your football seriously and play at a high level, you need a personalized strength and conditioning plan. You need your to play football at a high level, you need a personalized strength and conditioning plan to improve your strength and your fitness. You need your nutrition dialed in so that all your fuel is readily available for games and you're not eating the wrong things that are going to compromise your performance, as well as making sure you're recovering properly to reduce your risk of injury, amongst other things. There's lots of things and pieces of advice that I can give you as a qualified strength and conditioning coach and exercise scientist to make sure that you reach your potential. These days, being good at football isn't enough to get you to that higher level. I've worked with current AFL players in the State Academy and I know how hard they worked to get to where they want to be. If you want to be an AFL player or a high level player, I highly recommend heading to druziesathleteacademy.com using the link in the description and True Footy viewers get 20% off any program using the code TRUEFOOTY20 at checkout. Your performance as a footballer will improve with Druzy's Athlete Academy. All of my clients get results guaranteed. Take the guesswork out of your footy and start performing to your potential. Use the link in the description or DM me on Instagram and let's get started. On with the rest of the things. Number five, red hot D's punish the struggling ruse. The D's are on fire right now. Absolute fire, bro. When you see Petrarca getting 35 plus and three goals, Clayton Oliver getting 37, Cozzy Pickett kicking three, Bailey Fritch kicking four, the pressure relentless for four quarters. You just think... 2021, I've seen this before. The D's are in that form, in that premiership form. Brody Grundy settled in to his role. Maxi Gorn is back. They're just playing outstanding footy. And I know it was only against North Melbourne, but it just it has that hint, that aura of 2021 right now for the D's. They're absolutely humming. On the other side of the coin, North Melbourne. Don't know where that form in the first two rounds against uh, Rio and West Coast went. Maybe we're just absolute dog shit but North have absolutely fallen off a cliff. You don't expect much when they come up against Melbourne, but they're just so easy to score against at the moment, leaking goals like a tap with a hole in it. 
that that much leak, mate. That is leaky. The ruse are better than this, though. You can see in the first three rounds, they at least showed effort. So I don't know why they are playing so shit, especially under such a good po uh, coaching panel. And they have more talent than they're displaying right now. So they're a poor side in very bad form. I think they can be better than this. At least compete, North Melbourne. Come on. Number six, Charlie Kerno kicks a bigger score than West Coast. Another one of the best players in the competition right now, Charlie Kerno, absolutely dominated West Coast. Literally could have just been him against West Coast. We'll tally up all of West Coast's score and just Charlie Kerno's, and he absolutely dominated. He's a beast one-on-one, -on -one, so hard to beat, so strong, so athletic, got a high IQ. He's just banging in goals for fun. I think he's tied first for the common right now with Jeremy Cameron. His trajectory as a... <laughs> His trajectory as a footballer has just skyrocketed in the last few years, Charlie Kerno. When he was sort of coming through when Colton weren't as good of a side, we didn't think, or I didn't think anyway, that he could reach these heights. But he come back from that injury and he's just saying, my time is now. I'm a god. And he's playing like one at the moment. West Coast right now, they are in a crisis. Like They competed pretty well for the last few weeks. Um, but to come up against Carlton, who have a lot of expectations, a lot of talent, all Australian calibre players in their team, they've come off a loss. Like They were obviously going to bounce back massively against a team who are absolutely injury depleted with very little experience. And those players that are experienced really aren't playing that great either. So where to for West Coast? Couldn't tell you. Maybe Metro's. That That's all I've got for you. But yeah, Charlie Kerno was hungry to dominate bounce back after that loss against St Kilda and boy did they do it a triple point thrashing against West Coast just an absolute walk in the park number seven big win for Gold Coast Richmond have lost their identity hell yeah Gold Coast every week I come on here and I'm just happy for Gold Coast to win or when they lose I'm like god shucks I'd have to say Gold Coast might have to be one of my top five favorite sides just because I ride the highs and lows with you son Sun fellas, so good win without uh old Took Miller as well. So you've shown you can go away from home against a decent side and get a win without your main man Ben King kicking another bag of goals, showing the potential why he was such a high draft pick and shaking off the cobwebs after that injury. It's great to see. Nora Anderson continues to do great things for this Gold Coast side. Great win, great away win, much needed. Couple wins on the trot, great for the Gold Coast Suns and Stuart Jew. On the other side of the coin, Richmond, very disappointing once again. Richmond have lost five in a row, currently in 16th position. Yes, I'm just reading off my phone right now. One win, one draw, and five losses? Jeeba Leba. It's strange because they've drafted some decently talented players and they've still got a core of premiership players, but it's just not coming together at the moment. Like Jack Rewalt... Is he the player that he once was? He's obviously aging, but he's just not making that same impact as he once did. Trent Cochin, is he the guy that you want predominantly in your midfield? I know he's a premiership captain and a champion, but is he up to the standard anymore? Dusty's been in and out of the side for the last few years. The only real constants that I like in that side are like your Noah Bolters and your Liam Bakers. Uh, but beyond that, there's just no real consistent contributors everyone was really hot on Richmond at the start of this season and I couldn't see it at all to be honest after last year even though Frio only drew with them last year I wasn't really that massively impressed by them and to be honest my prediction has sort of come true like I know it's very early in the season but Damien Hardwick said they're not playing with any confidence at the moment I think they've lost all of that identity, all of that premiership DNA has been translated and transcribed. If you do human bio, you know what I'm talking about. If not, you're a small pea brain. But yeah, Richmond are far, far from those heights of the premiership years. They are completely lost at the minute. And I said last week the dynasty is done. Now I'm saying this week, maybe it's time for the rebuild for Richmond. Like, where do they go to from here? Do they get a new coaching panel? I'm sure they won't want to get rid of Damien Hardwick, but he might feel it's best to move on at the end of the season. There's going to be a lot going on over the next eight months at Richmond, I believe. They've also just signed Taranto and Hopper on those massive deals, sending away draft picks and signing them on big money, which isn't the great thing heading into a rebuild. Maybe the Tigers thought they could go again for another premiership. I didn't see it, and now the Tigers fans are also seeing it. They are very far from it. But go Gold Coast! Yes! Number eight. Tom Hawkins is a robot. 
How is Tom Hawkins playing football like he's a decade younger than he is? Man is aging like a fine wine. Physically, does not look like he's lost any strength or any pace. Not that he's the fastest player in the world, but it doesn't look like he's really slowing down as a footballer. To kick a career-high eight goals at the age of whatever age he is, he's a robot, it's relevant. It's mental that he's still having such an impact, especially given the fact that he didn't have a preseason and he's just building into the season, getting better and better every week. And I think we're seeing that from Geelong as well. They had a slow start to the season, but they're never really hot out of the gates anyway, Geelong. They sort of build into the season, get stronger week by week, and towards the end of the season is where you see them peak. Pardon me, I needed to get that burp out. Geelong have plenty to build on still. Their defence isn't as great as it was last year and their pressure around the ground can improve, but they've got time to improve that. And given the history of Geelong, I'm sure they're going to build into this season. Essendon have been a pretty tough side to beat for most teams this year. Started the season quite well. And Essendon did compete in that second half to a decent degree, but the slow start just didn't really give them a chance against the Premiers. Tom Hawkins is a robot. Somehow kicks eight goals at whatever age he is. Man's a robot. G.I. Joe. Calculating distance. Kicks snags like it's nothing. Could be a conspiracy, but I reckon Tom Hawkins is a robot. And uh, number nine, Collingwood are fucked. <laughs> what does one even say at this point? Collingwood, man. They led for like 21 seconds of this game or less than half a minute of this game. And you just knew it was going to happen. Even when Adelaide looked good, you just knew that Collingwood are going to come back. I don't think Collingwood even kicked a goal in the first quarter. Dominated by Adelaide. Adelaide, a great pressure side. And I was thinking, oh... Here we go. Collingwood are finally going to leave it too late. And Adelaide, a team with high pressure and good ball use, are going to win this game. Nope. That goal from Noble to arch the back at speed, ping one from 45 like it was nothing, was insane. That is such a high degree of difficulty to get that goal. And then the smarts of Ash Johnson, who I'm a massive fan of, by the way, to slap it over the line, just to tie it up and lock the ball in the front half. Genius. Very smart. And then they back themselves in, they back their method around the contest, get the ball out into space, which they were doing for a lot of the game, really switching the play, get the ball to steal side bottom, who just cushions it through for a behind, and they get the job done again. This team just knows how to win, the belief to win, the trust in the method of the coaching staff is unparalleled in the competition. Collingwood, keep doing it. I don't think there's ever been an AFL side that has done what Collingwood do every week. It is insanity. My Auntie Anne watches these games and goes, bloody hell, those Collingwood boys are alright, and she doesn't even know her rights from left. <laughs> Not shitting on Auntie Anne. The point is, they play exciting footy. If you had to introduce someone to AFL football right now, you'd show them Collingwood, because they are box office, and they have been for the last bloody close to 18 months. It wasn't Collingwood's best display, but they just find a way to win again against a very tough side in the Adelaide Crows. What more can you say about Collingwood? They are fucked. <laughs> but that's going to wrap it up for nine things we learned. But before you go, comment down below what you learned from this round. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure you drop a like, subscribe if you're new. And if you're an athlete looking to improve your performance, let me take care of that for you with Druzy's Athlete Academy. Use the link in the description and together we will make you play to your potential as an athlete. I'll be back next week talking about the football once again. But until then, I'll see you in the next video. Take care, you plonkers.